Okay, what we're going to talk about today is surfacing terminology. I find that some people kind of get confused sometimes when we start talking about shaders or materials or textures. And so I wanted to create a video that kind of explains it a little bit to make sure everybody's on the same page when we're talking about creating surfacing. Now, a lot of people call it uh, texturing an object. I don't really uh, refer to it that way. I refer to it surfacing. Texturing really relates to having a pattern on something and on everything needs a pattern on it. So I refer to it as surfacing, not uh, texturing. So in surfacing, uh, I wanna, um, there's kind of a pipeline that we create. And so the pipeline is like this. You have a shader. On top of the shader, you have material. Shader is the underlying algorithm of uh, how the surface is going to react, react to light. The material is kind of floats on top of the shader. It's the controls of how we control what the shader looks like, what color it is, whether it's shiny, things like whether it's uh, transparent. And then sometimes uh, we actually plug what's called a map to it. Okay, a map, there's a lot of different kinds of maps. So basically this is an external, some kind of external uh, file that we're going to plug into the material to uh, add attributes to it. Uh, a lot of times that's patterns, and so it could be a bitmap, okay, but it could be a procedural texture, it could be other things, okay. So you have an underlying structure, a shader, then you have controls on top of that, which is a material, and then sometimes we pl might plug a map into that, and then that goes, and that's what creates our surface, okay. So that pipeline, shader, material, map, then you have a surface. Okay, let's do a little bit of a history lesson. Before we actually get into the shaders, uh, I want to talk about uh, descriptive geometry. Now, what descriptive geometry is, is uh, where we're actually uh, plotting two-dimensional points in three-dimensional space, okay? It's kind of a drafting thing. This is what I had to do when I first got into computer animation in the 90s. You would actually have to, um, you would do drafting with a T-square, and we would draw two-dimensional objects and then once we had the two-dimensional objects drawn, then we would project the points in three-dimensional space using various uh, algorithms that we would calculate, and then we would draw them out, okay? And so descriptive geometry is the beginnings of uh, creating three-dimensional objects, okay? So in the early days, um, first thing and th that they were able to do in 3D is the calculation of vertices or points in three-dimensional space, which is basically what descriptive geometry is. We're just calculating where these points are. A lot of people have a tendency to kind of think of as humans, you know, we look at a, at a model and we look at the polygons, but the reality is, is that the, to the computer, it's all about a collection of vertices, okay? So then, you know, that was the first thing when doing computer graphics was they were able to calculate the vertices and then they would come in and then the next thing they were able to do is to connect those vertices with edges, okay? And so that's kind of the progression of um, how things, you know, started on a computer, okay? Then the next thing they were able to do was to take those edges and they started being able to create surfaces on those and that's where our polygons come from. The first surfacing... Uh, algorithms that they created uh, was referred to as flat shading, okay? And flat shading is really uh, vertex shading because what they're doing is calculating a, a, a value for a vertex and then that value goes over the entire polygon, okay? They're not really calculating the, the polygon itself, but they're calculating the vertices and that's why this gives you this kind of a faceted look, okay? But but early on, that was pretty cool that they were able to do that, okay? Then the next thing that came about was uh, a gentleman named Henri Gorod in 1971 invented what's called uh, vertex lighting, okay? So he, you know, his Gorod shading utilizes, uh, was able to, instead of um, calculating the surface, on the first axis is calculating the surface on the polygon, so you got this smooth setting, but the drawback was that the lighting on it was calculated still the old standard vertex. So when you had a highlight on it, you would see the faceting on it. So it was smooth, but in the highlight area, you would see some faceting, and so so the, you know, the solution then was to just make sure you subdivided the mesh, that the subdivisions were so high that you didn't notice that it had this kind of an artifacting going on. Then the next big step was in 1973, 
uh, Bui Tong Fong invented fong shading, and fong shading uh, was polygon lighting instead of vertex lighting, and so it solved that issue, and now we were able to have a nice, smooth surface and a nice, smooth highlight. But those are kind of the stages that uh, it has gone through. And when we finally got the fong shading, that's when we were able to uh, go to the next stage, which was at creating nice looking objects. Okay, so that goes back again. Let me just reiterate that it's shader, then material, then map and surface. Okay. All right. So let's kind of uh, look at this. Now I'm going to kind of relate this to a car to see if I can make this a little bit easier to understand. Okay. So in uh, shaders, there's a lot of different versions of shaders now. Okay. So we've got the Fong shader that I talked about, but then several years later, uh, a gentleman created the blend shader. Okay. And it's really was called a blend Fong shader because it was a version of a Fong shader. Uh, it had different attributes about it. Then later you had another one called Orin Nayer Blend, which is a version of a blend. Then you have another one called Lambert. And so there's a lot of different versions of shaders that we can pull upon, okay? Uh, in 3D Max, there's ways to select different kinds of shaders. In Maya, you can select different kinds of shaders. And these are all the underlying algorithms that we're gonna build our surface on. Think of it as like this car. You know, in this car, you have the base, shape, the base shape of the car. Uh, it has not started, it was not started putting, um, you know, uh, the surface on it, you know, it's not painted, they don't have the glass in there. So that's kind of the way the shader is. It's the base of what everything um, it happens with everything, okay? All right, so then the next thing that we do is we get to materials. Now materials are the controls of those shaders and with those controls, then we can take that shader and we can start giving it different attributes, okay? Like on this glass here, this is a physical glass, okay? Now, I'm using mental ray to demonstrate this, but this same is the same whether you're using V-Ray or Render Man. It's all the same thing. So the materials are the controls, okay? This is the, uh, these are all based, these are all templates for an arch and design shader in mental ray. So this is the default shader of an arch and design. Uh, it's the, I kind of think of it, uh, tell students it's kind of had the shininess of it. It's kind of like porcelain. And so, but they have templates in there. This is the Chrome template. This is the rubber template. And you can see that's what's giving, you know, this surface, you know, would, would give this surface the different qualities is we're using a, a shader. And then on top of the shader, you're applying materials and basically the materials are the attributes. And so I can tell it to be transparent parent or translucent, refractive. I can tell it to reflect the environment, uh, like in Chrome, or I can tell it to be matte. I can tell it to be opaque. So there's a lot of different aspects we can actually control, and that is the material. Now, for the most part, material and shader is kind of synonymous to the same thing because they're basically locked together. You normally are pulling out a a shader or material out of your library to use, and it's got the shader and the controls all together as one thing, and so that's a material, but a lot of people refer to it as a shader or a material, but there are a distinct difference because the shader itself is nothing other than the algorithm that everything is built on. It's the underlying structure, and then we're coming back on top of that and we're putting controls on it to, uh, to be able to control different attributes that we might want to control and that's what was referred to as the material. Now, the next thing that we have is what's called maps, okay? Now a map is something that we plug into the material, okay? So when we have a material, you can't really generate any kind of a pattern with the material, okay? We can give attributes to the shader through the material and make it translucent or a solid color, but you can't really add a pattern to it. And so a lot of times we're wanting to add patterns, okay? So we want to plug what's called a map in it. The term is map that we plug into it. A lot of people refer to it as add a texture to it, but their actual official technical term is add a map to it to add texture to it. And there's a couple of different ways that that can be done. One way is what's called a procedural. And a procedural is a mathematical algorithm. So a procedural 
and there are a lot of different ones. Uh, the one that we're looking at here is a speckle that's put in here to cause this kind of a metal flake on this. And so you have mathematical algorithms where you can dial in, you know, like the size of the speckles and the colors of the speckles and such. And uh, then you can get that and then it's, it's titleable in which that'll go across the whole surface and you won't see any seams on it, okay? Now this particular one, the shader right here I'm looking at is Autodesk Metallic Paint, which this specific shader has the speckle built into it, so it's not plugged in as a separate thing, but that's what you normally do is you can pull out a, a procedural texture and there are a lot of them, noise, there's a lot of different ones uh, and all softwares have them, Max, Maya, and you plug it in and then we can add patterns to this, okay? Now another way to add patterns is through a bitmap, okay? A collection of pixels, a, an image. Uh, a lot of people refer to that to a texture, okay? But that's another way that we can add things to it. And of course, these can be stacked together. So I could do a procedural and then stack a bitmap on top of it. You know, they're not, it's not either or, they can be added together. So in the case of this car, you can see that it's got some distinct uh, patterns on here, okay? Some logos and stuff on here. And so if we were gonna be modeling this and, and surfacing this, then we would actually create bitmaps for that, okay? Now this first shader is one shader, okay? So it's got one set of attributes. And so it, I, I left it at the default, which was a shiny uh, kind of a porcelain reflective material. And then what's happening here is I wanna put this logo on it. So I have the bitmap here and then I create a mask, okay? Now the mask, what it does is it's another bitmap that makes part of it transparent and part of it opaque so that it I can float it on top of this. A mask uh, in the software, black is transparent and white is opaque. So when I take this bitmap and I use this as a mask, then this white area of the bitmap is gonna be transparent because this is black and then the area where this is white will show the logo up and then you can see it sitting on top of there, okay? I also, because this has some kind of a zebra kind of pattern on here, I put a zebra pattern down here, but I wanted to show you in this case, all I had needed was the, the uh, mask. I didn't need a logo because it was a solid color and I was able to use a map node, a color node that piped color into it and I could dial in whatever color I wanted whatever RGB color and it would go through this mask and then it would give our pattern and I could put them both on there. Now, whenever you're putting a uh, map on, you have to put mapping coordinates. That's where you're uh, setting a, a set of mathematical coordinates of how you wanna put it on there. And in this case, I have two set of coordinates. I have one set of coordinates for uh, these two and another set of coordinates for these. Now, the other thing I included down here was a blend material. Now, blend material is a node where you can take two materials and you can blend them together. Now, the advantage of that is, as you can see the difference between this one and that one, is that in these areas where the logo is, I made it a little bit more matte, like it was a sticker on there, and the same thing down here. Okay, so how that's being affected is I created two materials, one material that was kind of matte and one material that was glossy. And then I use these two masks to mask between the two materials. And that's how I was able to control part of this being very glossy and part of this being matte. Okay. So, you know, your pipeline is we have a shader. Uh, most, you know, you might, you, those, according to the software and what you're doing, you might be able to choose between different shaders. In my case here where I'm using Arch and Design, Arch and Design is a blend shader, so I don't really pick which shader I want. It is a blend shader. And then I'm using these controls on top of it to give it different attributes, okay? And then we can actually put patterns on them, and those patterns are referred to as maps. There are other kinds of maps that are not patterns, you know, like color. I can use a map for a color. Uh, and you might ask, well, as to why would I use a for map for a color? Because I can just dial a color into the material. That's true. But let's say I had 14 items in a uh, room and I wanted different attributes to the shaders, but I wanted them all the same color. So I could use a separate map node and plug into those 14 shaders. That way, if I change the color, I could change that map and it would change all the shaders at the same time. So there are other uses for maps besides patterns. But the main one that a lot of people use is for patterns, and usually it's either a procedural texture, which is a mathematical algorithm, or it's some form of a bitmap, okay? And of course, those can be uh, used in unison. So that is the uh, actual uh, pipeline 
for uh, materials, okay? So the underlying shader, we might, you know, according to what um, you're using, you might be able to pick which shader it is. You know, most of the old school, you can do that. So like when you're in um, Max, and if you're not using Mental Ray, you're using uh, like a standard shader with Max's old scan line renderer, then you can tell it where you want it to be a blend or an ordinary or blend, okay? If you're using Mental Ray, Mental Ray is a blend and it has an ordinary blend built into it as well. And then you can dial between those. It's called a roughness setting in there. If you're in Maya, you'll have surface, uh, you'll have uh, shaders that you can pull out like a blend and a Fong and a Lambert. You know, those are all old school. Most people don't use those anymore because they're using advanced renderers like Mental Ray or V Ray. And so those have their own. Uh, physically based uh, surface shaders in those. And so you're not really picking the shader, but you're, uh, it's already built up for you. And then you're just using the material to control it. And then of course you're putting maps in there too. Okay. So that's surfacing uh, terminology. And hopefully that helps you understand when we're talking about uh, surfacing, uh, the difference between a shader and a material and a map. Okay. Thank you very much.